Love, 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 love. What do you guys think of when I say that word love? I remember my first love. It's a hopeless romantic as a kid. Emphasis on hopeless. But my first love, first grade, Bonnie. It didn't work out. The love is seen as romantic in this world a lot. When you say, when you talk about love, it's usually in terms of romance. You know, you think of uh, stories or movies like The Princess Bride, great movie to watch. You don't have to be a kid. You think of movies like The Notebook or The Titanic, right? Even classic stories like Romeo and Juliet. It's like this, this love that's unattainable or forgive, forbidden. And then there's this conflict and some sort of resolution or tragedy happens at the end of the story. And I think these stories are attractive because every human soul, we're created for this, every human soul desires, has a longing for a perfect love. And for the world, we try to find it in humans. I mean, some people, uh, you know, if you didn't know, I'm a dog owner. Some people find it in pets. And pets are pretty cool, especially dogs. You know, they, um, they're, they're so loyal and they, and they come and cuddle, but they don't have perfect love. They're not able to fulfill that longing that we have. So we turn to humans, perhaps. And maybe there are some of us who go from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship because we are longing for a perfect love or close to perfect love from a human being that cannot give it. And so we're disappointed after disappointed or disappointment after disappointment after disappointment because we're seeking something in someone who cannot give it. We all crave that unconditional love, that perfect love. And really, it's, it's God who, who can only give it because he's the only one who's perfect. No human being is able to give perfect love. Now, there are human beings in our lives that can give great love. Maybe you have benefited from a loving relationship with a human being, but it's not perfect. People are always going to let you down. But there is a person who will never let you down, even when things look grim. We're at work, we're, uh, fourth, the fourth week of Advent, Greatest gift of Paul, uh, gr the greatest gift of all, according to Paul, love. There's faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so we dive into the most famous verse of the Bible, John 3.16. See what kind, of God, what kind of love God has for us. And so let's read it together, John 3.16. Some of you guys have it memorized. It says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you that you love us unconditionally. Your love is beyond measure beyond our comprehension. And oftentimes, we don't recognize the fullness of your love. And so, this morning, as we look at this famous verse, Lord, give us fresh eyes to see. Give us fresh hearts to understand and perceive what we have not perceived before in this verse. Give us insight. Most of all, change our hearts. 
change our hearts. Pray in your name. Amen. Now we, oftentimes, this is, this is a verse that is famous. You see this verse at sporting events. It's quoted a lot of times in evangelistic enterprises. But we have to understand John 3.16 in context, within its broader context. And when we find, if we look at the beginning of chapter 3, this is a verse that appears in the midst of a conversation that Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, okay? And if we take off our modern Western eyes of what a Pharisee is, okay? It's not, when we read it in Scripture, it doesn't necessarily mean hypocrite, okay? That's how we use it today. But a Pharisee in the first century was a religious leader who was well-respected in their community. They devoted their lives to studying Scripture. They had other careers. Some were lawyers. Some were other professionals. Uh, but they were religious leaders. They were Jewish leaders that people looked up to and respected. Not all Pharisees were bad. There are some good ones. But that tendency led to legalism, the tendency to, to, to emphasize the law, which they studied so much. But there was this guy, Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, and starting to be curious about Jesus and thought, you know what, this, this guy is the real deal. And so Nicodemus goes to Jesus at night. He goes to him at night because he didn't want others to know. He wasn't ready yet to go public yet. But he wanted to talk to Jesus. He wanted to meet him. So he goes to him at night. And he goes to Jesus and he says, he says, Rabbi, I know you are sent from God. No one can do these signs and wonders unless he is sent from God. And Jesus responds and he says, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, there's a little, there's a little um, scholarly issue here with born again. Uh, the word actually means born from above. There's some debate here. But he mean the word again or uh, in Greek can also be translated as from above. There are two sort of meanings to this word. But what Jesus really is saying is from above. Nicodemus misunderstands, so he responds and says, well, how can a man go inside his mother's womb a second time? That can't happen. That's unnatural. It's impossible. So he misunderstands what Jesus is saying. He says, you must be born not only on earth, but from above. And so Jesus talks about this new birth, that you have to be born not only of flesh, but of spirit and of water. You have to be regenerated in your spirit. And so it's in this context that Jesus says, for God so loved the world. And the verse right before it, verse 15. Well, let's go to verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up, the, uh, just, uh, lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that, verse 15, everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. That everyone who believes in the Son of Man, Jesus, may have eternal life in him, for God loved the world. That is the context in which this verse appears. I'm talking about new birth, talking about being born from above, born again even. And so in this verse, we see five characteristics of God's love, or five characteristics of God's love. First, God's love is active. God's love is active. Now, it begins. We're going to dissect John 3.16 like you've never dissected it before. You ready for this? We're, go, we're going pretty deep. For God so loved, it begins. For God so loved the word. This word for is what we call in Greek grammar an explanatory conjunction. 
What it does is a conjunction that connects the previous context with what is about to be said, and it explains. You could translate this as because. Because God so loved the world. Right? The Son of Man must be lifted up. He's going to die on the cross that whoever believes in him will not perish or will have eternal life in him. The whole thing is about the possibility for us who believe in Christ to have eternal life because God loved the world. One commentator says this, the fact that it is only in connection with Christ that everlasting life is ever obtained is clear from this, that it has pleased God to grant the supreme gift only to those who repose their trust in him. That connection from verse 15 to 16, he says, the fact that it is only in connection with Christ that everlasting life is ever obtained, verse 15, is clear from this, that it has pleased God to grant this supreme gift only to those who repose their trust in him. Verse 16. Because God so loved the world. Let's talk about this, this phrase, God so loved the world. In our English translations, in modern English, what this seems to say is that God loved the world so much. Right? He so loved the world, you know? Some people were like, oh man, I, I so love coffee. I so love coffee. That means I love coffee so much, a lot. But in the original language, this is not what it means. Okay? Not that that's not true. God, that is true. God loved the world so much. But the language here is actually different. This word so translated. There's a, there's a minority meaning of this word so, right? When I say something like, um, uh, play the keyboard so, it's, it's not a really common usage, but what do I mean by that? In this way is what I mean. Play it as so, something like that. The word so means in this way. Hutos in Greek. So what this verse actually says, for God in this way loved the world. God loved the world in this way. And in this way is what? He gave his one and only son. We'll get into that in just a few moments. This word so, in this way, this is the way that God loved the world. God's love is active. It's not just about speech. It's not just talk. But there's action that accompanies God's love. Action that accompanies God's love. Now, my parents were not particularly uh, emotive people. They weren't real lovey-dovey people. Um, it's not that, that's not how they were raised, and that's not what, what they were used to. They rarely said, I love you. Uh, except, you know, when I was a kid, they would, um, like, a, like a child, my, my parents would uh, say the same. They, they, we spoke Korean at home, and so I'm doing a rough translation, but they would ask me a question, and I would answer uh, like a cute boy that I was. But they would say something like, you know, who's, whose kid are you? And I would say, Mom, mama's kid and daddy's kid, or something, something like that. Uh, whose kid are you? Mama's kid and daddy's kid. You know, and they loved it, and we, they would hug, and I would be like, yeah, I know, I'm the cutest kid, yes. They tried that at 13. I was 13 years old, and we are kind of sitting around at home, and my dad one time was like, hey, remember, uh, we used to have this thing together, right? I used to say, whose kid are you? And you would say, mom's kid, you want to try that again? You try that with a 13-year-old, it ain't going to happen, okay? 13-year-old's going to say, mama's kid and daddy's kid, it's not going to work. You know what? So, but aside from that, they weren't really emotive, they weren't really, you know, uh, verbally, verbally, like, you know, expressive. But I had no doubt, I had no doubt 
that my parents love me and my sister. And that's because they showed it. They showed that they loved us. They showed it by sacrificing themselves for us. They showed it by giving up their comforts so that we would benefit. They showed it by action. They didn't show it with words, necessarily. They showed it with action. God's love is shown by action and words. The Word of God tells us God loved the world, but is backed up by action in sending his one and only Son. Not just with words, but with action. And God's love is not just for our comforts, just to make us comfortable. That is not the objective of God's love. We're going to get there at the end, towards the end of our message today. But God's love takes us out of our comfort zones. And so that's why, that's why we could sit here in a pandemic that has spread across the whole world. That's why we could sit here in a lockdown. That's why we can look forward to Christmas, even though we are not going to able to celebrate the way we normally do. But we can still say, God loves me. That simple song we may have learned as a kid, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible told me so. Rest of it goes, little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Because God's love is active. It is active and working whether we realize it or not. Number two, God's love is universal. Okay? God's love is universal. It doesn't mean, I'm not talking about universal salvation here, okay? I'm not a uni, uni, unitari, Unitarian. Universalism is not what I'm saying here. But, let me explain. God's love is universal. For God so loved some people, right? That's what it says? <laughs> no, no. God so loved the world. God's love is the world, for the world. Refers, this word, word world refers to the people in the world, <laughs> right? Regar regardless of racial, ethnic, cultural, whatever identity, God loves the world. But this is not talking about the world in the sense of the worldly system that exists, the evil that exists in the world. There are different shades and uses of the meaning of this word world in Scripture. And you cannot put the same meaning onto every passage. For example, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, the same author says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. You know, and, and some people are like, wait, wait a minute. God loved the world, but we can't love the world? Let me finish reading the world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. First John 2. These are different uses of the word world here. In 1 John 2, it's talking about the things in the world, the evil aspects that, are, that has penetrated the world. John 3.16 talks about the world in the sense of the people in this world whom God loves. So in one sense, we are not to love the world but in another sense, God loves the world, and we should love the world too. Context determines meaning, right? Context, context, context. Context. It's very important. Even for life, <laughs> right? You can say the same sentence in one context, it means one thing. Say it in a different context, it means another thing. So, you gotta pay attention. 
Now, speaking of context, we've got to understand this word world, when, 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 when the Gospel of John says, God so loved the world, you've got to under, also understand the background context, the Jewish context. Because, and this is significant, because Israel as a nation always saw itself as a privileged nation in this world. Saw itself, you know, even though they went through so many years, so many periods of captivity to surrounding nations, you know, they had a lot of national pride because they were God's chosen nation. And so only Israel is chosen by God. They had this national pride, maybe to national arrogance. You know, also, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, right? And in some Bibles, if you have like a red-letter Bible, right, which uh, highlights Jesus' words in red, I don't like that, you know, because this is all of God's word, and, and in many ways, all of Jesus' words. So to distinguish that is, uh, you know, something I don't agree with, but there you have it. If you have like a red-letter Bible, though, you might notice that in verse 16, Verse 15 is read, but 16 is not read to say that these are not the words of Jesus. But there's a continuity here that I believe that Jesus is saying these words to Nicodemus, but also for public knowledge. God loved the world. So he's saying this to Nicodemus, and he's saying that in order to receive eternal life, you have to be born from above, born again, have the new birth, however you want to put it, right? Right? And it's not just you, the Pharisees. It's not just Israel, but it's the world that God loves. In fact, in the very next chapter, John chapter 4, Jesus speaks to a Samaritan woman, right? which was a faux pas in those days. Right? She was Samaritan. She was of a different nation. They were kind of rivals. Jewish people and Samaritans were rivals in some ways. <clears throat> so they shouldn't have been speaking. He was a man, she was a woman. They shouldn't have been speaking in public, alone. But he does that to represent that God loves the world. There's such a there's such a continuity here in this. Gospel of John is amazing. So it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how you've lived your life in the past. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a different religion, different context. All that doesn't matter because God's love is universal. Number three, God's love is sacrificial. God's love is sacrificial. This is where we get into the meat of it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God loved the world in this way. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. This is sacrifice. This is sacrifice in the ultimate way that no one else could sacrifice. One and only son. Hey, this, this can take a long time to explain. We could spend a lot of time explaining this. This is a, this is a unique word for a unique concept. <laughs> one and only son. The Greek word here is monogenes. Monogenes. And the meaning here, see, there's, well, before I get into that, there's an older translation, usually in the King James Version, which says, only begotten son. And because English, the English language ha has evolved over the years, you know, some words have slightly different nuances now than it did back in 16th, 17th century. The word in the Greek, the original language here, refers to 
uniqueness or a being one of a kind, one of a unique kind, one of its own kind. This word is used of Isaac in Genesis 22. Isaac was the only son of Abraham. But actually, he wasn't the only son because Abraham had Ishmael before him with another woman. But Isaac was the unique one, the one and only son, the, the, the one-of-a-kind son, because he was the one through which Israel would become a great nation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes. And so while he wasn't actually his only son, it refers to unique one, one of a kind. This word also appears in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Psalm 24, 16. It says, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Lonely. What this psalmist is saying is, he feels like he is unique, one of a kind, lonely, by himself. No one else can compare, is what he's saying here. That is the meaning of one and only son. That God's son is unique, not like all the other sons, incomparable to any other but this, he is the only son that is unique. The significance of this, you can see this, right? That God gave the most irreplaceable gift in this whole universe. No one like Jesus, no one like the Son of God, and God gave him to us. That sacrifice to give the only thing that you have, irreplaceable. (laughs) The story of a boy named Johnny, he had a younger sister, and sister had to be hospitalized, had some complications, and the doctor said, you know, we, we, ha- we need your blood, Johnny. We need, you, know, you guys are the same blood type, and we just need your blood so that we can give it to your sister so she can be healthy. Johnny looks at the doctor, and he just, he just pauses. Swallows says, okay, I'll do it. Doctor's like, don't worry. You know, it's a simple procedure. I know you're nervous, but, uh, you know, we do this all the time. You look concerned. He says, okay, okay. So he goes and we draw blood from Johnny. Give it to his sister. Doctor checks up on Johnny, says, how are, how are you feeling? How are you feeling, buddy? Johnny goes, how much time do I have? Doctor's like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And then it clicked. Johnny thought he was giving his life for his sister, that if he would take his blood, that he would die, but his sister would live. Sacrifice. God's love has given us given us something that someone that no one else could give. I heard someone say that love isn't love unless it costs something. And I believe in many ways it's true. Love isn't really love unless it costs something. Maybe it's time, maybe it's money, maybe it's our energy, maybe it's whatever else it costs. 
You know, it's easy to give $10 to somebody. You know, here you go, 10 bucks. But for someone who doesn't have a job, someone who's struggling, 10 bucks means the whole world. You know, I, I received a gift recently, 10 bucks. And it was, I was like, all right, cool. But context of who gave it. While they are struggling, to sacrifice like that, that $10 gift is worth much more than a $100 gift from someone who's wealthy. I'm not saying don't give me a $100 gift, okay? I just understand what I'm saying kidding. God's love wasn't just costly, though. It wasn't just costly. It wasn't just, ah, this is a bit painful, but here you go. It cost him the most important and valuable person, his monogenes son, his one-of-a-kind son, his unique son, the son that there was a perfect love relationship between, along with the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead in perfect love and perfect relationship, and to give the Son to the world because He so loved the world. The ultimate sacrifice. He gave it for us. He gave it for us. He gave it for you. He gave it for me. He gave Him for you. God's love is sacrificial. Number four, God's love is attainable. For God so loved the world that he gave his monogenes son so that whoever believes in him, it says, whoever believes in him. God's love is not out of reach. God's love is not just somewhere out there. It's not theoretical. It's not abstract. God's love is attainable. Anyone can receive God's love. Again, related to God's love being universal and for everyone. Anyone can attain God's love, but it takes faith. Whoever believes in him, it says. It's not just believe him but is believe in him. You understand the difference there? Not just to believe him, but to believe in him. Kind of a picture of you diving inside the pool. You're all in. Not just saying, hey, I see that pool, it exists, cool. Okay, I dip my toe in there. But it's going all in. Now, here in my version, it says whoever believes in him. But the idea here is all who believe in him. Everyone who believes in him. Whoever sounds like it's just, you know, whoever. But it's all, all who believe in him. Everyone who believes in him. If you believe in God, you attain his love. If you believe in Jesus, you attain his love. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's difficult, right? When we're going through hard times, when we're going through difficulties, it's difficult because God seems far off. Seems like he's not around. Where are you, God? Hello? Sometimes God's far off because it's not that he's far off. We're far off. Sometimes God's far off because he wants our attention. You know, you know, you know, with my dog sometimes, like, um, be before all of this madness happened, he's taken to the dog park, and when I want their attention sometimes, I'll kind of hide, I'll kind of walk away to see if they notice, you know, and if they're preoccupied, like, with a little wood chip or something, it'll take a while, 
But if I really want their attention, I'll just go towards the gate. Like, okay, see you guys, bye. And they'll notice, and they'll come running <laughs> at me because they're like, I can't go, I, you know, my master. And they'll come back. I think God does that sometimes. He kind of pulls away a bit to see if we, if we notice. We can't notice unless we have faith in God. Sometimes he asks us, do you, do you believe in me even though I don't give you everything you ask for? <laughs> Are you willing to believe in me even though you're uncomfortable? Sometimes that happens. But when we act in faith, we see that maybe not God doesn't give us everything we ask for because some things we ask for may not be good for us. We act in faith. We sense more and more God's love for us. It just happens. It's not that he stopped loving us, but we stopped sensing it. You have to believe. You guys, you guys heard of that footsteps poem? Sometimes it's, there's a picture, a lot, a lot of Christian uh, bookstores or, or I think even our, our office has it. I pay good attention to what's on our walls, apparently, but it's footsteps, right? The poem goes, I'm just going to summarize it, but there were two footsteps on the sand. There was a time, particular time, where this narrator was going through a hard time and said, during that time, I only saw one, one pair of footsteps. God, where were you during that time? And God said, I was carrying you. It's funny how we perceive things, right? All who believe in him, we must believe in order to attain God's love. You can't sense love from someone you don't believe. Five, God's love is purposeful. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his monogenes son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, will not perish, but have eternal life. <clears throat> in Greek grammar, this word that or so that is a purpose conjunction. It connects the before and after to signify purpose. The purpose of God's love. The reason why God so loved the world to give his only son is that we would not perish but have eternal life. All of us who believe would not perish but have eternal life. The purpose of God's love is so that we would be saved in this world. We often don't think of love in terms of purpose. It sounds a little too mechanical maybe, right? You're like, hey, uh, I love you and uh, I have uh, five purposes, <laughs> reason why. How romantic, right? We think of love in terms of emotions or feelings or what have you, but Think about it. Think about it. Someone does something for you, right? It took a lot of planning. You can tell they, they had to think it through. It was fully thought out, planned out. There's a purpose behind it. Doesn't that make that gift much more interesting? Does it make it more meaningful? Rather than just, uh, oh, yeah, uh, here you go, just off the cuff. I mean, that's meaningful, too. That could be meaningful, too, okay? But a gift, something, love that is purposeful. You know, like, you know, if you have children, if you had children, you know, and they create something for you, a piece of art, 
and it would never sell at the museum or an art gallery. But that work of art is the most meaningful thing you'll receive because it's from your kid who took time and effort to create that piece of work. For God, he planned out his love for us from the very beginning. From the very beginning, God loved humanity. He knew humanity would fall. And he found a way to save humanity from ourselves. Theologians call this redemptive history or redemption. This plan of redemption. Where God foresaw what humanity would do, what we would do. Starting with Adam and Eve, but all the way through human history. Saw that we would rebel, we would go against God. And so he said, I have a plan. I'm going to send my one and only son so that they would have eternal life that they lost. Again, God's love is not necessarily this lovey-dovey stuff that we see from Hollywood or in books. God's love is much greater than that. It's active. Shows us his love by action. God's love is universal. Right? For the whole world. God's love is sacrificial. That's an understatement. God's love sacrifices everything he had. God's love is attainable if we believe in him. And God's love is purposeful. There was a perfect or there was a purpose by which God showed his love. It wasn't just out of an emotional outburst. Because God felt one day, hey, I feel like it. Next day, I don't feel like it. No. It was a conscious, determined love that he had for humanity. And for each one of us. Isn't this the perfect love that humans long for? That, cra- that we crave in our hearts? This acceptance is who we are, that, some, that we mean so much to someone else that they would sacrifice their very lives for us. Isn't that something that we all crave deep down in our souls, that we are accepted and loved? No human can give that in a perfect way that God can give that. And so why do we go to others? Why do we seek it in others? Why do we make other people God when God himself is the only one that could save us from ourselves and fulfill that deep longing that we have? God is the only one. And his arms are open wide. He wants us to come before him. Not to serve other gods or idols. You know what I mean by that? In modern days, serving idols is not bowing down to some created image. Today, serving idols is looking to someone else to be God for us. God is the only one. He wants us to come before him. He wants us all to himself. If you've never experienced God's love, I invite you, if you happen to come across our YouTube channel and you're listening to this, thank you. But it's not about us. It's not about getting more views. It's about if you make a change in your life and if you realize God's love. So if you've never experienced God's love before, now is the time. Today is the day. Come before him. Lift your hands to him and say, God, Let me know your love. And maybe you've been a believer for a long time. You've been going to church for a long time. You've never experienced God's love.
You're missing out. But you can still experience it. I don't care if you've been going to church for 40, 50 years. You can still experience God's love even if you never have. Because all who believe in Him, all who believe in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And that eternal life is that it's not just living forever. That's not what that means. Eternal life means enjoying life in the love of God. God. Can we close our eyes right now? If you're at home, close your eyes. I ask you to close your eyes. And we could spend a minute. Just talk to God. Or listen for God.